From the Watson Institute at Brown University, this is Trending Globally. I'm Sarah Baldwin. Last January, humanity met its newest enemy, a novel coronavirus that surfaced in Wuhan, China. The virus and COVID-19, the disease it causes, soon began their relentless spread. Scientists in China are trying to determine if a new virus strain is responsible for pneumonia outbreak Attention. in the city of Wuhan. China says the number of people infected by a mysterious respiratory infections will peak until May, and that as many as 3.5 million people could die. Over the weeks and months that followed, what had once seemed unthinkable, even alien to Americans, became a reality. Offices and schools closed, large gatherings were prohibited, People started wearing face masks in public. In our home state of Rhode Island, Governor Gina Raimondo issued a stay-at-home order on March 28th. Soon, almost the entire country was on lockdown. The U.S. economy spiraled. In Rhode Island, the unemployment rate jumped from 4% in January to almost 18% by the end of April. As May 1st approached, one thing became clear. Many people wouldn't be able to pay their rent. So in addition to a public health and economic crisis, the risk of widespread evictions entered the picture too. This special series of Trending Globally is called Less to Lean On. We partnered with students from Brown University and the media collective Signs of Providence to look at how the coronavirus has affected evictions in Rhode Island and its capital city. It's a topic that is just one piece of a web of other seemingly intractable issues. And one thing's for sure. Eviction was problematic long before there was a pandemic. And while it's a traumatic event all by itself, eviction is also a symptom of much greater ills that haunt this country. A housing crisis, income inequality, and systemic racism. As the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, and so many others remind those of us with the privilege to forget, COVID-19 is not the only pandemic facing the United States. As a physician, I'm here to state that racism is indeed a public health crisis. COVID-19 has only pulled back the curtain on anti-blackness. Later in this series, we'll reckon with the comorbidity of racism and housing insecurity. Whether America is unable or unwilling to house its citizens, housing insecurity is one of the most pressing issues of our time. We're going to talk with advocates, activists, attorneys, scholars, and people on the ground to understand how the problem started, who it affects, and how we might eventually dig ourselves out of this mess. Spring 2020 was a time of unprecedented uncertainty for everybody. But for many renters, it was like being dealt a triple blow. First came the risk of contracting a potentially fatal illness. Next, they or someone in their household may have lost their job. And finally, there was the fear of being evicted. Jordan McMahon is the supervising attorney with the Center for Justice, which provides legal representation for low-income people in Rhode Island, including when it comes to housing. A lot of renters are extremely anxious right now. They're confused, they're frustrated, and they're really angry about the vulnerability of their housing. Uh, Folks who've been working and going to school and doing everything that they were supposed to and just didn't have a support system in place to weather a a four-month unemployment pandemic. My daughter, they gave her a layoff because she worked in an ophthalmology center. So they just give her layoff and they told her she can apply for uh, unemployment benefits. Also, my other two stepson, they give them a uh, layoff. That's Christian Malvo, a 45-year-old carpenter. He lives with his wife, daughter, stepson, and baby granddaughter. My only really concern is about my baby granddaughter. She's going to turn four years old. Is my sweetheart. Their home is on the second floor of one of the many three-story apartment buildings known as triple-deckers that are typical of Providence and the working-class towns around it. Of course, we're worried uh, because the thing is, my wife, she takes care of uh, everything from now on. 
but she had to pay the rent. She had to pay the gas bill, the electricity bill, the cable. She had to pay for her car because she got a loan on that car also. The insurance of the car. We're struggling. We're struggling. You know, we don't know how we're going to pay the rent. With a population of just over one million, Rhode Island is the smallest state in the union, but it's a state that had big housing problems even before the pandemic. In Providence alone, the majority of renters were considered cost burdened. That means they were spending more than one third of their income on rent. For many, it's one half. Every year in the US, 3.6 million eviction cases are filed, leading to one and a half million eviction judgments annually. In Rhode Island in 2018, more than 8,000 evictions were filed, 2,600 of them in Providence alone, a city of fewer than 200,000 people. Imagine that for a moment. Imagine suddenly having to pack up your possessions. Imagine having to leave some behind. Imagine calling family members or friends to see if your kids can sleep on their couch until you somehow find another place to live or having to find a shelter with beds available that night. And imagine getting to the shelter only to realize it's at capacity. Eviction's been linked to a wide array of devastating economic and health outcomes. If you're evicted, you're more likely to lose your job, move to a disadvantaged neighborhood, or live in lower quality housing than before. You're also more likely to get sick, suffer from depression, and experience homelessness. Ketia, who works in the healthcare sector, knows firsthand what eviction feels like. So do her two children. They were living in the tiny working-class town of Central Falls when a series of misfortunes lost Ketia her job. The landlord kicked them out after a few missed rents. Within three months, Ketia's family went from happily housed to sleeping in the car. They eventually found their way to a stable living situation, but the experience left its mark. I remember one day... We had a little issue with, I think there was mice in my current apartment, and we had to pack up everything. And my little boy, um, he was asleep, so I packed everything up and put it on the table. And he woke up freaking out, oh my God, are we going to lose our house again? What's going on? And I didn't, until that point, I didn't know how devastating this whole process was for him being so young. And if all that weren't enough, the eviction court record will be attached to your name for the rest of your life even if you win the case, even if the case is dismissed. Take away the added stress of a pandemic, and eviction is already an event that surfaces a host of other problems, including the extent of and reasons behind the rampant housing insecurity in this country. Three quarters of renter households that would be eligible for federal assistance are unable to get it because there isn't enough funding. That's Mary Joan Bull, the author of Housing in America. Housing is unlike, for instance, food assistance under SNAP, the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program. If you qualify, you will receive the food assistance. Housing has never been that way. It's crucial to point out that some populations are more vulnerable to eviction than others. Research from the ACLU has shown that on average, black renters had evictions filed against them at nearly twice the rate of white renters. Women of color, and particularly black women, are especially vulnerable to eviction for many reasons, including pay disparities and wealth gaps, not to mention more than a century of racist housing policy. If you're not sure what I mean by that, or if that sentence makes you raise an eyebrow, this series is for you. We'll be tackling this issue in subsequent episodes. I do want to also really emphasize the issue of racial discrimination and disparity in housing. COVID has provided a good way to sort of highlight that. There's a lot of people who are actually making things happen for those of us who are well off enough to have a pretty easy life of it. Just go to the store and spend things are there that we need. All of that rests on people who are housing insecure because they're not paid enough 
to get private housing and there isn't enough affordable housing. There are so many ways that your comfortable life rests on the work and the sacrifice and the precariousness of other people's homes. Governor Raimondo is giving another important local update. I want to begin, as I do every day, thanking uh, everybody who is helping us, especially the folks at the Department of Health. On March 17th, the Rhode Island courts closed for 60 days. That meant there would be a two-month pause in processing evictions. Meanwhile, the state's coronavirus-related jobless claims approached 65,000. If you have been laid off, Due to this coronavirus crisis, you are eligible for unemployment insurance. Additionally, you'll be receiving another $600 a week every week until July 31st. And many also received a $1,200 stimulus check from the feds, which is nice, but here's the problem. In Providence, the median rent for a two-bedroom apartment is almost $1,500. So for most families, $1,200 is not enough to cover one month's rent, let alone two or three or more. I've been getting a lot of questions around what are we doing for the homeless? What are we doing for, for children in poverty? What are we doing for uh, folks who need access to food and clothes and homes and transportation? Ketia, whom we heard from earlier, is securely housed now and she hasn't lost her job. But her experience makes her worry about other people. How are these people going to be protected when this is all over with, are they going to have to pay back rent? Are they going to have to pay late fees? What's the law on that? But the state hasn't provided an answer. In fact, Rhode Island received one of the worst ratings in the entire country on the Eviction Lab's COVID-19 scorecard for its poor response. So activists and organizers took matters into their own hands. Stop evictions now! Stop evictions now! Stop evictions now! Stop evictions now! Then, on May 4th, Governor Raimondo committed $1.5 million for emergency rental assistance in the form of $5,000 grants, enough money to cover 300 requests. A few hours after the website went live, the money was gone. That same month, a report by the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston predicted that once the unemployment benefits and federal dollars run out, more than 51,000 households in Rhode Island will be at risk of not making rent. On May 28th, two days were left before the courts were set to reopen and eviction proceedings would resume. Activists seized the moment. When the courts are scheduled to reopen for eviction proceedings, there are hundreds of people already on the backlog who will be going into eviction proceedings immediately on June 1st. Elena Scorpio is a member of Tenant Network RI, a recently formed group that organized a rally at the State House in downtown Providence. On a lukewarm overcast afternoon, protesters in cars and standing in front of the Capitol building held signs saying things like, evictions are cruel, tax the rich to fund homes for all, and what is Rhode Island's moral compass? Drivers circled the state house in their cars, honking their horns as the governor gave her daily pandemic briefing inside. People are going to have to choose between their health and their homes, their health and their livelihoods. And we find that completely unacceptable. As Elena sees it, in order to tackle this problem, we need to think big. Bigger than we have in a long, long time. As Rhode Islanders, we have an opportunity and we have the vision to rethink how our housing market works entirely. We need to rethink housing and acknowledge that housing is a human right. The next day, as the number of confirmed COVID-19 cases in Rhode Island approached 15,000, Governor Raimondo extended the state of emergency and therefore the eviction moratorium one more month through July 1st. The moratorium doesn't just affect renters, of course. One renter's check is another person's income. And today, the entire rental housing ecosystem is nervously waiting to see what will happen when July 1st rolls around. Eric Hirsch, a professor of sociology at Providence College, has been studying housing issues for decades, 
all the way back to his days as a graduate student at the University of Chicago, where he helped form a tenants union. And he's not optimistic. Generally, we have about a thousand people homeless at any given moment, which is a thousand too many. But we are about to have many, many thousands if this eviction moratorium isn't put in place. Christina Contreras-Fox, a policy analyst at the Rhode Island Coalition for the Homeless, agrees. We're going to have more families out in the streets or desperately trying to find shelter in the middle of a pandemic. We're going to see more people going back to unsafe living situations. We're going to see folks who fled domestic violence situations having to make the choice of going back to their abuser and having a home or staying in shelters or staying out of doors, staying in places where they know they're not safe and they could be hurt again. I'm scared of it. Like, I, I, I am scared to think of what's going to happen to, to our folks, like to our community. But what will also happen is we're going to keep fighting and we're going, like, as this problem escalates, so are we. We're going to escalate this fight. We're going to keep trying every single thing that we can to help our folks because there is just, like, there's no other thing that we can do. And there's no other thing that we should do besides everything that we can. We still have time. And the state has time. And the state can act before July 1st. Let's pause here for a moment and take a look back in time. Since the arrival of Europeans, power in America has meant controlling the land. Indigenous people have seen their land taken away for hundreds of years. Though it's not the same, one very early record of eviction and homelessness in Rhode Island can be traced back to Roger Williams, the 17th century minister and theologian. As a white European, Williams was unusual in his day for his perception of Native Americans as potential allies. He was also among the first abolitionists. What he's perhaps best known for, though, is his advocacy for religious freedom and the separation of church and state. For those convictions, Puritan leaders accused Williams of spreading new and dangerous ideas and expelled him from the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Homeless, or actually banished, Williams wandered many miles to the place we now call Rhode Island. There, in the midst of a devastating winter, he was given shelter by members of the Wampanoag tribe. He eventually purchased land from the Narragansetts, and in 1636 named his settlement Providence, in thanks to God. At the same time, of course, human beings were being forcibly brought from Africa to the colonies as indentured servants or slaves, and by the 1770s, Rhode Island had the highest population of enslaved people per capita in New England. That's a 400-year-old reminder that from the beginning of Rhode Island's story, from the beginning of this country's story, race and racism and those who are deemed deserving of shelter and dignity have been inextricably linked. But through the centuries, waves of immigrants have also sought shelter in this state. Italians, Portuguese, Cape Verdeans, and more recently, Central Americans and Dominicans. Black Americans from the South came here too as part of the great migrations of the last century. By the 1970s, Blacks had become the most highly urbanized segment of American society. That phenomenon and the ensuing backlash led to white flight to the suburbs. The purposeful disinvestment in Black urban communities, segregation by interstate highway and other racist urban planning tricks, and many more of the insidious practices that created the problems that plague housing in America today, including eviction. One of the myths we tell about this country is that everyone has a right to prosperity and growth. And while some groups, it's true, have been allowed to climb the economic ladder, often by purchasing land or a home, others have been explicitly denied that right. And America has become a very rich nation. So shouldn't we wonder how it is, even in the midst of a pandemic and an economic recession, that we can't or won't guarantee housing as a basic human right? You've 
met a lot of characters in this episode. You'll get to know some of them well before we're done. If you are a tenant, landlord, lawyer, or someone whose eviction-related story we should know about, please reach out to us at watson underscore institute at brown.edu. This episode of Less to Lean On was produced by Oscar Danjac with help from Dan Richards and Jackson Cantrell. The theme music is by Henry Bloomfield. There are too many contributors to list here, but you can find them in our show notes. I'm your host, Sarah Baldwin. Thanks for listening.